Welcome back, our college youth group. We missed you guys last week. Welcome to all of the new faces that I'm seeing in the crowd. Just wait till people, there's a whole front two rows are available. We'll just wait as people get settled so that we can get started. Just take a minute or so. So excuse my, my PowerPoint this morning. This, the PowerPoint is for like the second half of my talk. Didn't save the, the first several slides, so, so I'm just going to just listen and give your attention to me. All right, everyone had a seat. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We are concluding our series on how to be a sinner. Sorry for the typo. How to be a sinner. Um, I'm sure some of you, when you saw the title, you're saying, good, I don't need to read this book. I'm a great sinner. I know how to sin very well. I don't need instructions on how to do it. But what this book is teaching us is how to be, how to approach our sinfulness and how to approach what sin does to our life and what it works in our hearts and in our mindsets and how it affects us in so many negative ways. And what we want to talk about this morning, so a few weeks ago we spoke about how we are the worst of sinners and how St. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners, I am the worst of all sinners. And that was when he said that when he was at a very high spiritual life. <clears throat> he wasn't talking about his past, he was talking about his present. And the second thing that we talked about last week is low self-esteem and how so many of us how we need to deal with our low self-esteem and how God sees us as sinners, that God sees himself in us and how we need to view ourselves and how we need to view him. And today, we want to talk about something that is really like affects so many people and I think it beats up so many people and it is actually a reason in which people can't grow in their lives with God and they can't grow and they can't go forward because they're dealing with guilt. How many of us have, have felt guilt so much that you, you messed up, you, you have a bad habit, you keep on, that you just feel so guilty that you can't even look at God. And we need to know how to deal with our guilt because how am I supposed to face God, you want me to stand up and pray, I can't even look at him because I'm so ashamed of myself. How many of us have been in that position before that you can't look at yourself and you can't look at God? You see, if you don't deal with guilt in the right way, the devil is going to use it to crush you and to make sure that you are never part of the kingdom of God. Not because you are a sinner, because God came for sinners, but because you don't know how to deal with your guilt. It gives us feelings of despair and hopelessness. It affects righteous people. It affects lost people and people who have turned to sin. Just to give you a few definitions, guilt, what guilt means is regret, to feel regret. You know, to, to, to feel regret over your sin. Shame is maybe like the difference between that is, is shame is a feeling about something that I am, right? I am a thief. I can't look. I am a thief versus I stole. There's a difference between I stole so I feel bad. I am a thief. And that's sometimes the shame or humiliation that some people feel because of your own things. Maybe you feel shame, people in your family, right? The, uh, you're ashamed of something that your children have done. You're ashamed of something that your parents have done. You're ashamed of something that you feel like you have become. We're going to talk about that. But yet guilt and shame play a very important role for your salvation. You need to feel guilt, right? You need to feel this feeling within you, just like the body, right? When the body has some type of infection, when something is going wrong, what, is, what does the body do? When you have an infection, what does the body start doing? You start to get a fever. You start to feel chills. There's an attack going on. Your body is telling you something is wrong. Fix it. Because if you didn't know, your limbs would just start falling off, right? So when you have 
a fever or you start to feel the chills or you start to feel weak, your body is telling you something is wrong, change it. That's what guilt should be doing. If guilt is doing anything other than that, the devil is using guilt against you. Guilt should be something is wrong, I need to change it. And not all guilt does that. Because sometimes you feel guilt and you feel like what? I cannot face God. I cannot look to God. You know what the devil does? He puts his arm around you and he says, God is so mad at you. Like me and you, we are partners and we're in on this together. But God is the bad guy. He's so mad at you. He will never accept you. How many times are you going to do this sin? Like you call yourself a child of God. He's got his arm around you. And you're actually like cuddling with him. You're cuddling with the devil. You're saying, yeah, God will never forgive me. And where is God? And how come God? God is not the bad guy. The devil is the bad guy. Okay? And this is important for you to understand as we approach this concept of guilt. One of the most significant symptoms of our human nature, our weak human nature, is that your ability to discern right from wrong, sometimes with sin, becomes compromised. You can't even tell what is the difference between right and wrong. That you eventually become cold inside. You do that. Now, this is the opposite of guilt when you start to feel, justify your sins. That like, oh, like I, you know, th there's reason for what, or what I'm doing isn't that bad. Or there's nothing wrong with a little bit of lie. It was to protect somebody. So the opposite of guilt is justifying your sins. That's even, even worse. Then you eventually cloud your conscience, you ignore it, and then sin starts to what? Destroy you. How many of you have gotten to a point where your conscience, at some point, or with some sin, not all sins, but some sins, you've become numb in that? You say, like, I don't even feel it anymore. Maybe you used to feel it. You used to feel that guilt, but now you feel like, no, no, it's not that big of a deal. Who doesn't do that? Who doesn't lie? Who doesn't have a second look? And who doesn't think like this? We all do, right? And so we end up numbing our consciences. And this is where guilt is a healthy thing. That when your conscience becomes numb and cold, guilt, when you start to feel a little bit of, of conviction inside, you feel a little bit of shame, that's a good thing. You're inside, the Spirit of God is saying something's not right. You're not going down the right path. So guilt has a positive side and it has a negative side. So right now, I'm just trying to make it clear that not all guilt is bad. Guilt is good. But it's good if it's understood and used in the right way and we respond to it in the right way. There was actually um, in the book, if, you read, if you're reading the book, one of the largest automobile manufacturers, Volkswagen, was caught cheating. They installed a mechanism in their cars that lowered the vehicle's harmful emissions only when it's going under a test. So when they are doing a test to check, you know, whether you, the, the, the car is, you know, emitting bad stuff for the environment, when you take the test, the car will produce a, like, it'll control that. But otherwise, the car is always emitting very, very bad things. And so you know what Volkswagen has did, had done, is that they numbed their consciences. They allowed themselves to cheat because whatever feature was going to, I don't know why they would do something like this, but maybe it would save them in building the car. So they numbed their conscience and they allowed themselves to do something so evil that they said, the car will only be healthy when you're running a test on it. Other than that, it's, it's sorry for all you Volkswagen owners out there. <laughs> but we do the same thing when we suppress our own consciences to what we know is wrong. What do we say in the Agbeya, in the midnight hour? We pray to God, we say, Lord, give me a fountain of many tears. Right? Don't we pray that? We say, Lord, give me tears for my sins. I actually want to feel convicted. And that's why the church tells us how to pray. When we pray the Agbeya, I want you to understand something about the Agbeya. The Agbeya teaches you the posture in which we approach God. 
It teaches you the words in which we use and how we approach. We rejoice in his salvation. We praise him in the Psalms, but at the same time, we stand before him saying that we cannot stand before you. Okay? That we cannot stand before you. We need your mercy. We come before him and we throw ourselves in his presence. The Agbeya is a great tool to teach you, especially when you feel guilty, is how to stand before God. I don't know what to say. I'm kind of embarrassed of myself. I really can't look at God. I did what I did willingly and knowingly, and I didn't care in the moment, and now I feel terrible. Pray the Akbayah. So we pray this prayer, give me a fountain of many tears, asking God for the remorse of our sins. I found this, sorry, it's not in the PowerPoint. I'll, I'll put it up here. As I'm going through the book of Isaiah, and I found a beautiful verse, and I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I feel. Isaiah 63, verse 17. Listen to this verse. Beautiful verse. It's a prayer of repentance. He says this. O Lord, why have you made us stray from your ways and harden our heart? Listen to this. Harden our heart from your fear. Pay attention. Look at it again. He's saying, O Lord, why have you hardened our heart from your fear? Obviously, it's not God that has hardened our hearts. But he's saying, why have you allowed our hearts to become so hard that we don't fear? Please do the opposite. Help me to have a healthy fear of God. The Bible says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Now, we're going to read a passage. Follow along with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. All right, everyone look at the screen because I want you to understand it. I'll read it slow, but I want you to follow along with me. St. Paul's talking about to the Corinthians, he had written them an epistle or a letter. And they were, the Corinthians were kind of a messed up people. They were doing a lot of wrong things. They had very shameful things going on among the church. They had a son that was, there was a, a young man who was lying with his father's wife. Okay, it wasn't his mother, it was, a, it was like a stepmom or something. So here he is, there's all kinds of sinful things. So St. Paul wrote a very tough letter to them. Now, this is the context of what he's saying. He says, for even if I made you sorry with my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle or letter made you sorry, though only for a while. Now pay attention. St. Paul is saying this to you. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. You see, the guilt and the sorrow that you feel should lead you to repentance. And if those feelings make you step away from God, that is not from the Holy Spirit. If you are feeling that I have sinned, and I've committed something against God, so let me step away from God, you have been deceived by the devil. Listen to the rest of the passage. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Pay attention. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation not to be regretted. Right? That your sorrow leads you to repentance, which will eventually bring you salvation. So the guilt feelings that you feel... If it brings you to repentance and say, Lord, I need to change. I need your power. I need this sin out of my life. I need you to remove it from my heart because I can't handle this anymore. I can't face this temptation. I will fall, Lord. Lead me to repentance. This will lead you to what? Ultimately, your what? Your salvation. What about the opposite? What if I don't feel the sorrow? It will lead you to your condemnation. So that guilt, you don't want it to be numbed. But at the same time, you don't want it to take you away from God. Listen to this. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So when you become so depressed and destroyed from your sins, it leads you to what? Death. It's leading you to death. 
It's not giving you life. God does not want you to have so much sorrow that it leads you to death. He wants your sorrow to lead you to life, that you would have life in Christ. That's all that God wants to give you. He doesn't want to punish you. He doesn't want to beat you over the head. He doesn't want to slap you and say you're a terrible person. He wants to give you life. So the sorrow is so that you could have life. Listen to this. For observe this very thing that, you're so, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. Now, let's talk about what the guilt did. That when the guilt led to repentance, look at these words. It says, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal you had, what vindication, in all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. He says, look at the change that took place in you when you had guilt. You became serious. Sometimes we need to feel guilt. Not by being beaten over our heads, but because if your numbness is there and you don't care, then you're in a very dangerous position. So God, sometimes you find maybe a preacher up here is, is, is being very firm and very strict. It's very hard. It's not to make you beat yourself up. It's to say, be careful. Because if the enemy leads you to death, that's it. You're going to be so broken. It's going to be hard to pick up those pieces. Not that God can't do it. But be careful of that. You see, St. Paul is saying that your remorse helped you become a better community. I read a beautiful saying that says, Compunction then gives our inner life and our prayer life. What is compunction? It's when you feel so bad that you actually want to stop the sin. How many of you ever felt that feeling? That I felt so bad. Sometimes I have people that tell me, Abuna, I, I have gotten to the point where I have, I have smoked too many joints. Now I can't do it anymore. It's destroyed every part of my life. It's destroyed my career. It's destroyed my marriage. It's destroyed my marriage. It's destroyed my friendships. It's destroyed my brain. I hate it and I will never go back to it. And I'm like, so you don't need me to convince you anymore? No, no, Abuna, don't talk to me about this anymore. It has ruined my life enough that I want to stop it. So compunction, what is compunction? It ensures that when you stand before God, they're heartfelt. You say, Lord, I know I've sinned and I hate this sin. I don't want this sin in my life anymore. And I'm real about it. There are times when we pray, we are not saying it in that same tone. We are not saying that I have sinned can you just wash it away and make it go away? No, no, no. It's I have sinned and I never want to do this again and I need your help. Do you have that spirit? Again, everybody wants to be washed. Nobody in here doesn't want to be washed. But many of us don't want to stop. And that's the, that's the dangerous part. Let's move on. I want you to think about in the... In, in, in the book, it says, in interviews with politicians or high-profile corporate officers, they're often asked to list the mistakes they have made in their careers. It's a risky question to answer because such leaders want to project competence and in some cases avoid prosecution. What does that mean? Saying sometimes when you ask a leader, like a politician, tell us about some of the mistakes you've made in your career. I can't answer that question because then maybe if you knew that I made these mistakes, you're not going to vote for me. Well, one time I was speaking with, there was a bishop doing um, a Bible study, and I differed with him on opinion. St. Paul says something. He says, I held nothing back from you that was useful for you. So I said that we as leaders need to talk about some of the things that we've learned from our mistakes so that other people would not go down that same path. He says, no, Abuna, never say that. Never let them know that, that you know, any of your, your struggles. You should never share that with your people. My people need to know that I'm a real human being. We are all in the same boat. And we are all struggling. And so I have this disagreement because St. Paul says, I've held nothing back that was what? 
useful for you. Even St. Paul, in speaking to his leader, said, look, I made these mistakes as well. I made these weaknesses. Now don't go down this path because I will tell you what will happen. What will happen to your life when you go down this? I met with a, during my 40 days uh, in the monastery, I met with a, a hermit. And I was sitting with him in his cell that was deep in the desert. And he was telling me a story about when he first entered the monastery. He was in the monastery of St. Macarius. And there was a time where the monks of St. Macarius in the 70s lived in a place called Rien, which is like a, a valley that's like basically all caves and it's just vast desert. There's no water, there's no food, there's nothing. And this young monk is sitting around these older monks and they're talking about the good old days in the valley of Rien and how we used to pray and we used to get together. And the monk left so defeated. He left so defeated and he went back to his cell. He's like, yeah, you guys were saints. You guys didn't struggle. He doesn't have hard times. And he left and went to his cell. One of the old monks came, knocked on his door at night and said, Abuna, I want to talk to you. He said, he said, yes, father. He said, I want you to know in those days we had a lot of hard times. We were arguing and we were wondering why we came to this desert and why we were whatever. And we were demotivated and we wanted to give up on the monastic life. And the younger monk told the older monk, he says, I've learned more from you in this last 30 seconds than I did of hours listening to the glory days of when you were in the desert. That I want to know, I want, you to under, I want to understand that you're a real human being and that you have struggles. And part of this is identifying your reality that you are a sinner. It is okay that you identify and agree that I am a sinner. Now let's listen to this. Because part of the sweetness of this conviction stems from owning up to your reality. Brokenness and shortcomings are part of this life. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me that it is okay that you have shortcomings and it's part of this life and you have made mistakes? St. John the Short says this. Consider that the easy burden, the easy burden to carry is self-accusation. He says it's easy to accuse yourself. The harder thing to do is self-justification. This is John, St. John the Short, who was a great father of the desert. He said, the easier thing to do is to say, look, I'm a sinner. That's, that's easy. It's not hard to, to, to admit to that. He says, the harder burden to carry is that what you're justified in, your, in what you do, that you're okay in the sins that you commit. You know what he's saying? He's saying, you are going to be tortured by this lie that you are living. You're going to be tortured by the lie that has told you you are fine. And you know deep down inside you're not fine. He knows that you're going to be wearing a mask and you have to maintain this image that you're perfect and you're not perfect. It's okay to be a sinner. It's not okay to sin. It's okay to understand that you are a sinner. All right. So what are we going to do? You see, Satan loves to torment people to remind them of their past sinfulness. So now we'll go to our, our PowerPoint. Like we said earlier, godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. The next thing is the accusation of the devil. The devil's going to accuse you. Look at Revelations 12 verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. Listen to this. For the accuser of our brethren, the enemy, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. The enemy is an accuser. And he's going to tell you every day that you're nothing. And it's the biggest door to the enemy. He makes you feel unworthy to pray or to draw near to God. So what is false guilt? What is the false guilt? What is the guilt that we want to be delivered from? Let's look up here. False guilt is actually a symptom of unforgiveness in your heart that is directed to yourself. There's a story in Matthew chapter 18. Everybody look at me. I'm going to tell you guys a story as opposed to me reading it to you. Matthew chapter 18, there was a, a master or a king who had a servant who was in debt with him, of him, 10,000 talents. 
10,000 talents was this, a, like, like this huge number of money that you could never pay back. And the king, he came and begged the king and the king forgave him. And then, here we're going to read it, just the last verse, because I want you to read this last verse. Then this servant had somebody that owed him a hundred denarii, which is a, not too big of an amount. And he owed him all of this money, and he wouldn't forgive him. And he grabbed him by the throat, and he says, pay me every single thing. Listen to this. And he would not, went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. You know what that means? When the master delivered him to the torturers, he says, if you're not willing, not just to forgive others, to forgive yourself. If you cannot forgive yourself from the sin that you have committed after repenting, I want you to understand that God is going to deliver you and say, that's it. The torturers are the ones that are going to torture you about this. The torturers are going to torture you because you can't forgive yourself. I want you to think about that sin in your life that you came, you confessed, you repented over, and the devil tells you every day that you're nothing. We talked about this last week, that you're garbage. How could you ever become a child of God? How could you ever stand and pray? I want you to remember that sin. You know which sin I'm talking about. We all have that sin. Okay? If you cannot accept the forgiveness of God and cannot forgive yourself, the torturers are going to come. What does it say? It says, the torturers, you'll be delivered to the torturers until you should pay all that was due to you. You see, the torturers are your inability to... Con to forgive yourself. Colossians 3.13. I want you guys to understand this verse. St. Paul's telling the people of Colossae, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. You know what the Greek word is for one another? It actually includes yourself. This verse is not forgive one another. It means forgive one another. Like, I forgive you and I forgive myself. That is what this verse means. He says, you have to forgive yourself. Otherwise, you will never be delivered from the guilt that you feel. Have you repented? I'm going to give you guys a rule that you need to understand. Guilt before repentance is from the Holy Spirit if it drives you to the the presence of God to ask for forgiveness. Guilt after repentance and confession is from the devil. Don't believe it. When after you have sinned and the devil tells you, come on, you think it just goes away just like that? You know what you did. But I repented. No, 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 but you're still a sinner. And you still have all of this filth in your heart and in your life and your body is unclean and your mind is unclean. What the Bible is trying to teach us is that that guilt is from the devil. That guilt is from the devil. Do not accept it. You say, I have been washed by the blood of Christ. I am forgiven. That when St. Augustine, a woman from his old sinful life, came knocking on his door one time and said, Hey, Augustine, it's me so and so. He says, Yes, it is you, but it is no longer Augustine. I am not that person. Don't come knocking on my door again asking for the old guy. I confessed and I repented. I am no longer Augustine. So when the devil tells you, but you know what you did, I'm not that person. If I repented and I came before God, you tell the enemy that is torturing you every day, I am not that person. I've been washed by the blood of Christ. Have you confessed? Have you repented? You have to understand how guilt is cultivated in your heart when you continue to allow yourself to dwell and think about how badly you've messed up in your past. You know what St. Paul says? St. Paul says in Philippians, there's a part in Timothy where he says, I was a persecutor, a violent person, an insolent man. He's talking about his past. 
And he says, and I talked about this a few weeks ago when he says, I I'm the chief of sinners, but God demonstrated his mercy. When he showed me long suffering, that means he can save anyone. That's what St. Paul's saying. If, you can save, if God could save me, he can save anyone. This is what St. Paul's saying. Then he goes on and he says this. He says, forgetting those things which are behind, I press on towards the goal. St. Paul had to forget that he was the one that, that agreed to Stephen being martyred. St. Paul had to forget that he was persecuting the church and that he was throwing Christians in prison. He said, forgetting those things which are behind, I press on towards the goal. The, the, the fathers have described it as the wise forgetfulness. The wise forgetfulness to say, I am no longer that person. Are you willing to be washed today? I'm asking you now. Are you willing to be washed of your sins? Are you be willing to say, it is no longer Paul? Tell me all you want to tell me about what I did two months ago. Tell me all you want to tell me about what I did last year. It is no longer Paul. It is no longer Mary or John or so-and-so. It is no longer that person. It is so important for us to know that we need to, like St. Paul said, forget those things which are behind. But it's got to be through repentance. You can't just say, okay, good, Buna Paul, you just, you just gave us forgiveness. And, uh, no, I need to repent. I need to confess. I need to come before God. But I want you to know that all your sins are washed away. All your sins will be washed away. Be careful of the stronghold of guilt. A stronghold is a lie that is believed which results in an incorrect thinking pattern. This lie that says, I'm a sinner and I can never be forgiven. What it means is you don't actually believe in the forgiveness of God. So how to deal with guilt? Step one, understand the nature of God's forgiveness towards you. The prodigal son story, who told the story? In the Gospel of Luke 15, who's telling this parable? Who's telling the parable? The disciples? Jesus is telling the parable. He says, this is how God deals with sinners. This is how God deals with the sin, the, the son who has done everything and he comes back in repentance. This is how God deals with him. What does he do? He accepts him with open arms. He loves him. He restores him. You see, Jesus is saying, this is how I deal with you when you sin. Do you accept that or not? Number one, you have to understand God's nature of forgiveness. Step two, you have to repent of your sins and confess them if you haven't done so. Step three, know that your past sins have been forgiven and that you are now clean in Christ Jesus. Look at this verse in 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faith. Listen to this. Pay attention. Don't let your tiredness not let you hear these words. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just to cleanse. Step four. We just said this. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Jesus made it clear that we are to be forgiving and that includes forgiving yourself. I want you to understand something about how to do this. You need to have a change of mind. You need to have a change. St. Paul talks about this concept of the renewing of your mind, that you would change your mind. Sin has made your mind messed up. Right? Your mind sees and thinks about sin in so many different ways. Either you love it or it messes you up so much that it makes you far from God and you reject God. So St. Paul's saying, I want you to renew your mind. You need to change your mind. And how do we do that? We have to put all, to make up for the past, we have to put all effort to the present and the future. It means changing making a plan of action to bring about this change. If you're an alcoholic, can you work as a bartender anymore? No. If you are an alcoholic, you have to stop the environment that is causing you to sin. You have to cut it off. 
You have to make a plan for change. You need to make a concrete plan and admit. What do they say? Behavioral psychology tells you how to plan for these things. Instead of saying, I will try and do better, it says, I resolve to do this. So, I will try to stop smoking. I resolve to go and to get a, a nicotine patch and to wear it and every day meet with an accountability partner and, and, and have somebody check it. I resolve to do this. Be careful if your guilt is not bringing you to the point of I want to change and I will make a plan to change. Today when you go home, you've taken communion, you've heard the word of God, you've heard about dealing with your guilt, go home and make a plan. Make a plan of how I'm going to deal with my guilt. I'm going to end with this story that I'm going to read to you. It's a beautiful story. And I want you to hear it. There was a young man who was traveling on a train, and the older gentleman sitting across from him noticed that he seemed very nervous. So the older gentleman asked the young man if there was anything he could do to help him. He told the older gentleman that he had had a terrible argument with his parents years ago and had left home. He said he hadn't had any contact with them in 20 years. He was realizing that his parents were getting older and that he had been foolish to cut off all communication with them. He wanted to see them again before they died. The young man said that he had written to his parents a letter and asked if he could come home. He told his parents that he would be on this particular train and he told the older gentleman that the train tracks ran right behind his parents' house. He told his mom and dad that if he could come home, they were to hang a white cloth on the old tree out there by the railroad tracks. The young man told the older gentleman that if he saw the white cloth, he was going to get off the train, but if he didn't see it, he would just keep on going. What made the young man nervous was that he was afraid that the white cloth wouldn't be tied to the tree and that his parents did not want him to come home. He was afraid to even look out the window, so the older gentleman said he would watch for the white cloth in the tree. About a mile from the station, the young man just closed his eyes and the older gentleman prayed that there would be a white cloth on that tree. What else could he do but pray? As the train rounded the bend, the older man's eyes got wide and a smile spread across his face. He told the young man to open his eyes and look at that tree in his parents' backyard. Because on that tree, his mother and father had tied every pillowcase, every sheet, every handkerchief, every dish towel, and anything they had that was white, and that tree was white from top to bottom. It looked like a snowstorm had hit it. Jesus' parable is the same thing about his acceptance for you as a sinner. That on every single branch of every single tree, God would put that white cloth to tell you, you are accepted. You are washed. St. Paul tells us to sprinkle our consciences. Clear your consciences with his blood. Say that you have been washed by the blood of Jesus. Today, God wants you to deal with your guilt in the right way. Guilt is positive and it's negative. It's positive because it tells you that I need to make a change in something. But it's negative when it pulls me away from God and says, stay away from God. Today, the Lord is telling you he wants to wash you by his blood and give you a new beginning. And he is telling you that you are forgiven when you come and you repent and confess and say, I want to be made clean. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray.